This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Welcome back to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast. I'm your host, David Charlton, and today I have another excellent guest lined up on the show. This time we chat a lot about rugby, as well as touching on other sports, exploring how you define mental toughness in rugby terms, how to cope with stressors and pressure, how coaches can best help players to develop their mental toughness, as well as a lot more. Enjoy tuning in and listening to Professor Adam Nichols and his wise words. So, Adam, how would you define mental toughness in rugby terms? Yeah, I think defining mental toughness is a is a real concept, uh, contentious issue. Uh, there's quite a, it's been within the academic literature. There's been quite a lot of debate between uh, colleagues such as or researchers such as Daniel Jacari in Australia, Peter Clough, who was a, a former colleague of mine in Hull. Uh, and then there's a uh, Hardy, J, uh, Lou Hardy, uh, Banger. But when you look, when you read all the different com- uh, these different definitions and con- conceptualizations, I think the key to defining mental toughness is about an athlete's ability to be able to perform well under pressure, so that their performance is not adversely affected by pressure. So if we're looking at that in rugby, then so it's an ind- it's a, a, a player. Who is able to execute his skills, uh, stick to tactics, stick to a, a program, uh, a routine? When it's a goalkeeper, for example, despite the prevailing pressure, so it's almost not that they're immune to the pressure, but they can handle it to the extent where their performance doesn't deteriorate, and in some cases may even uh, improve. The, in the sense that some people may thrive on the pressure, viewing situations as a as a challenge. So that's kind of how I would see and uh, see mental toughness within a within a rugby setting. And that that's going to differ, obviously, from in a competitive in a competitive situation, as in a match, compared to in training. Yeah, I think so because if you think within a competition situation, if we're looking at say professional level. The stakes are much higher within a in a match situation. Playing in front of a crowd, it's more more pressure on the players in the sense that you know mistakes can lead to matches being lost. Whereas in training, there is a pressure there. As so I've, I've done some research, we looked at stress in professional rugby union players on training and match days, and actually training days are stressful. But that that's not necessarily because the players are fighting for their place within the team. So there is a pressure there in training, but it's probably more, I'd say it's more amplified uh, within matches. And that's when, I guess, those who are mentally tough will will probably more likely to shine. So in in terms of, I'm going to take you back a few years now, a a book that you you produced there, you mentioned about the development of mental toughness. So do you see that as having a positive impact on a player being able to handle those pressures? Yeah, I think, yeah, development is massive. So it's about individuals going through sport processes. So experience of training, experience of dealing with setbacks, experiences of of playing matches. So being experienced playing in front of a crowd, being experienced being dropped, how you come back from that. Uh, Learning from what worked, what didn't work. And and I think that all of those... uh, those life experiences, experiences generated from from playing rugby, are massive to helping individuals become more mentally tough. We looked at, again. We did some research. This was published way back in two thousand and nine, and we looked at the relationship between experience and mental toughness, and we found that those who were the most experienced athletes were the most mentally tough, indicating that that experience is really really important. I guess. When you experience the lesson, there are fewer uncertainties about what's going to happen. You kind of been there, seen it, done it. There's probably not a lot that can happen that you're not aware of, so that when things happen, you can you can deal with them. 
Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. That about the experience, meaning yeah, yeah, your levels of mental toughness are going to be higher. So yeah, what what advice would you give to a coach then who's maybe working with young younger players in order to enhance their mental toughness? Yeah, I think there's a really there's a really good study published by Bell, uh, who was at Banger under Lou Hardy, published in 2013. And their intervention was really interesting because what they did is they exposed young uh, England cricketers to stressful situations, to pressurised situations in training. So they would have like, you know, maybe small punishments. Uh, and then, but they also taught them how to cope with stress. So they taught them a variety of different coping strategies so that these young players can become accustomed to, to performing under some sort of pressure. But then equally given, but also then taught how to evaluate stress differently. So focusing on the, the challenge of the situation, understanding how to regulate their emotions. So I think for coaches, it's really important, or not really important, but one way that they can help develop mental toughness is through exposing people to, to stress. Almost, I guess, kind of pressure-proof in their, their performance. And then when you introduce small elements of pressure and stress in training, you can then, as a coach, you can view how the players are coping with that. Is their performance deteriorating? Okay, if it is, well, then we'll maybe just turn down the pressure a little bit or teach them different uh, strategies to manage the pressure and then revisit the situation. Or is it that certain players, actually, they're thriving really well under the pressure? And in those situations, you might want to actually just increase that pressure just slightly. Because then when the, the players go into match situations, and maybe if they're you know, young developmental athletes looking to turn professional, they've actually had some levels of, 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 of performing under pressure, which I think is really, really important uh, to give people that, that experience. So you're almost like, uh, you're increasing the experience. So you're kind of exposing them to really important situations and you're kind of accelerating that development of mental toughness. Well, that's what we'd like to happen. Uh, and it, yeah, and, and, and the intervention uh, in, suggested that, that that was effective in, in improving mental toughness. And that was the key thing that they did was this exposing people to, to pressure. Yeah, and that make, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, really? Because you, although you can't exactly simulate what's going to happen on a match day, that's as close as you, you, you're going to get there. Um, yeah, you can have like, you can have forfeits, you can have... Uh, so one thing uh, I was uh, speaking to a boxing coach a few weeks ago, just about how we can, wh- what can we do to do this? And he works with England boxing, so all developmental athletes hoping to get onto the Team GB pathway. So when they have their, so going from sparring in a gym with no one watching to fighting a, a competition, one ring, lots of people stood around, is incredibly stressful. So one thing we kind of discussed was actually, what is there an in-between? So maybe the idea of uh, having people around the boxing ring and cheering, that's added pressure. So the, the boxers are actually getting used to uh, to fighting in front of a crowd. Another example would be actually going to a different gym. So instead of just sparring with your own, with people from your gym who you know, sparring with other people from a different club. With this crowd here, the crowd shouting and you know, being encouraged to make as much noise as possible. So that when they then have their first competitive fight or a bigger fight, they're actually, they've got this experience. They've got something to fall back on. And I think the coach made a really interesting point. And he said that actually by doing that, you will be able to see whether who, whether certain individuals are ready or not ready. Rather than throwing them in there at the deep end, not being ready, then they might leave the sport. Because there's, ma- there's massive problems with dropout in uh, amateur boxing. So, yeah, so I think, like you say, we can never, ever replicate it fully. But I think by using our imagination, we can we can come up with strategies to try and get as close to that as, as possible. Yeah, you can certainly challenge them and, and support them along along the way in that sense. Yeah. So there's one one thing that springs to me, springs to mind for me as well, would be if you're going to develop mental toughness, then you, you need to ensure that athletes are more self-aware especially at at that younger age so allowing athletes time to to reflect and to actually learn and by asking damn good questions as a coach that that surely has got to be important as well yeah self self self-awareness is massive uh really important and 
So I'll just go back to my first, my first PhD study. I interviewed 20 uh, Irish international adolescent golfers. So they're all part of different various Irish teams. And what we looked at, we looked at experiences when they coped effectively and experiences when they coped ineffectively. So i.e. when they probably didn't perform that well. But one thing that we found is that there was a lack of self-awareness. So for example, the, all of, you know, all, you know, most of them were either scratch plus one, you know, real good, low, low handicap golfers. And they would say that they knew something was going wrong, but at the time they weren't sure of what. So they would maybe, if they normally did two practice swings, they might do one, they might not do any, they might just put the ball in the tee, hit it, speed up their routine, walk quicker between shots. But they, they didn't have this awareness of what they were doing at the time. So I think, and, and we know that that coping is central to mental toughness. Coping with stress is really, really important. But then you have to bring in this self-awareness. So, you know, one thing when I did when I did consultancy with with golfers, particularly younger golfers, was about increasing their self-awareness of and so how we did that was was I asked them about times they played well and also more importantly, understanding about times when they'd not played as well. So get them to kind of be aware of certain things they were feeling, but maybe also behaviours. So one chap I work with who now is a, he's now on European tour. I work with him as a 15 and 16 year old. So a really good like developmental age, you know, which we call the investment years when they're really receptive to things. And, and at the time he was, he'd not played for England at this time, but he was on the, the, the cusp of it. So one thing he would do in match play situations was he would avoid any of his teammates. Uh, he would try and avoid coaches. I mean, go out of his way to avoid them. Uh, and he'd be worried, you know, be worried about what if his other teammates were winning. And if he wasn't winning, he would rush his shots, completely change his routine. But again, so it was about increasing the awareness of that. And that's always the important thing is increasing the awareness. So those negative behaviors didn't stop straight away. But the key difference was, was that now he was aware of them. And that, that awareness is the key then to then eliminating them and, and that happened over time where so he, he kind of understood that, that some of the things he was doing were not really conducive to him playing well but it's almost like him uh, you know having the courage to take that extra time if he needs it or to take the normal amount of time that he would take over shots regardless if an England coach is watching or a Walker Cup coach is watching if four of his teammates have finished their match early and are stood behind him about him having the courage to, to to go through his own routine that he would normally do and, and kind of shut out those negative thoughts. And again, so this, going back to this developmental and self-awareness, I think that's so important. And I think as, as psychologists, or sort of coaches, that's something that, that we can be doing when working, especially with young athletes, and not even just young athletes. I think some athletes who are in their maybe late teens or even early 20s may have this not be fully aware of themselves or and, and I don't even think it's an age thing I think it's a personality thing and so just as a psychologist and a coach just having an awareness of or having an understanding of the people that we work with and you know and looking at that as a, as a key factor yeah there's there's two things that, that I, I liked about the your comments there so when you, you were talking there about the, the golfer and the the fact he would distance himself from his from different people and coaches and what have you. Um, yeah, that to me, you know, it's a very individual thing, isn't it? To him, that's going to work. Whereas to somebody else, they actually may need that social comfort um, blanket in order to to feel good in themselves. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's, it's always about in, individual. So while he was doing this, it just, it was, uh, it was kind of detrimental because it was taking him away from his game and what he should be doing. You know, it shouldn't be focused on, or, we, you know, with discussions, he, you know, he felt that he shouldn't be focused on other people because, you know, I, I pose questions such as how, uh, how are other people influencing your, influencing your shots, your shot selection? It's like, well, they're not, they shouldn't be. And it's like, so well, how do we then prevent that from occurring? And then, so we developed pre-performance routines and then we then, you know, go on the, on the, the driving range with him and we'd practice them. And, and we were quite fortunate. It was end of a season as well. So we had a bit of time to actually work on these new, you know, pre-shot routines and, and practice some of the coping strategies that we were working with ready for the next season. And that can be an issue as well. It's like when you, as a psychologist, 
when you introduce these new new techniques. Uh, and I think it's really important that they're practiced uh, away from competition. Because I think, like any, if you're learning a new skill, you're developing a new swing, you know, a new swing technique, they can take time to work. That's my experience anyway. Uh, and, and to be kind of pressure-proof so that they work under pressure. You know, when these golfers really need them, you know, when they're winning a competition or when they're fighting to make the cut, that they know they can fall back on this this pre-shot routine because they've done it so many times before. Yeah, and that, that's, as you say, that's where the practice comes in. Um, yeah, so many people out there are quite reactive and they just expect a... <laughs> The magic fix just like that and it doesn't it just doesn't work that way <laughs> no yeah i know i've experienced yeah. that no i yeah I, I, that's one thing i guess when i work not that i do much consultancy now but when i have done it's always about you know i guess giving an education that you know for some people it, you know very very few people it might work straight away they might see an immediate improvement but actually the, the, the stronger improvements will, will come with time and with practice i'm, I'm going to go back to that scenario there you mentioned about the, you, you know your golfer there who who's distanced himself because yeah i've done some work like quite recently with with a good talented golfer who when we've we've done some profiling we've had discussions they're a very sociable person and they they get a lot from practicing with other people um however they see other golfers operating like like this guy being very individual and shutting themselves away from the world so they've tried to perform in in that way but they found it very well just not conducive to them um and it's still a still a bit of a battle um often that can be the case for people yeah absolutely it, it yeah i suppose we all have our personality and it might be that by him being sociable it actually relaxes him and it you know it, it helps his golf but then is it taking him away from you know the, the task at hand because if you think about the golfer who you know, he's a social golfer. He goes into a match play competition where, I don't know, he's maybe playing for England or a, and then you're playing against a golfer who isn't sociable. And then that, how, how the other golfer behaves shouldn't really have an impact on your behavior, on, you know, on your golf. So if I'm thinking, oh God, he's not talking to talk to me. I need someone to talk to. I need that. Well, actually, it, it shouldn't, that, that shouldn't be there in a sense. Well, that's what I would think. I, I was, you know, that they should be there prepared to play their own game. And if, if there's a conversation to be had, if the, if both the golfers are feeling it, then yeah, that's brilliant. I just think at these age group levels, the, the competition, the stakes, they, they perceive them to be so high. And, and I think with this golfer, he was seeing everyone as a bit of a threat because they're all fighting, you know, so at this, this stage he was playing for, for the county and he was fighting for England selection, as were, you know, they'd be playing other counties, as were the other players. And the competition there between them all was, was so great to an extent where I'd say probably, uh, you know, at times it was having a detrimental impact on his performance until he got this a grasp on it, really. Yeah. And, and really that, that's where our work comes in, isn't it? To, to mentally prepare them for, for those challenges of playing with a sociable person, with an unsociable person and, and putting some strategies in place to, to deal with those different situations. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that's where I guess we earn our that's where we earn our crust, isn't it? Really, that's our bread and butter of of helping these these young athletes and preparing them for you know thinking about what could happen. Okay, if that happens, how will you react to that? If this happens, how will you react to that? So almost so, so you, when you work with these young golfers who don't have that experience, that they've got systems in place and processes in place which they can fall back on if. Uh, you know, if, if, they, if they need it. Mm. Which links us nicely back to the whole self-awareness theme. <laughs> it does. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And, you know, you, you mentioned as well about routines. And, you know, if you would ask a golfer or a goal kicker in rugby to write down what it is that they actually do in the build-up to kicking the, the goal kick or the, the hitting the golf ball, the a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people just yeah would, would be clueless. They, they wouldn't know where to start with with that exercise. Um, yeah, and a lot of them would just do different things every time. Yeah, that's the key. I think. Yeah, I think when they get to a higher level, I think they're probably be a bit more consistent. But I remember, I, I remember years ago, I spoke to the psychologist who worked with a, at a conference who'd worked with a British Open winner, and just I think one thing he said that was really interesting in terms of his pre-performance routine. He said, if he was winning or losing, it would uh, it would 
his pre-performance routine would speed up massively. So if it was winning, it's because he was anxious, wanting to get the shot over and done with. And if he was losing or missing a cut, it was just like he couldn't be bothered to just ping the ball down. And and that's one thing he worked with actually. He'd walk around with this golfer and he would they were time pretty short routines. And after years of practice, he was saying they got it down to within a few seconds, every single shot, regardless of whether he was winning uh, or losing. And this was a, you know, this was a major open winner. And I thought that, you know, that's something, that conversation I had with this psychologist must have been in the late, yeah, early 2000s. And that, that, that conversation, I guess, has stuck with me. And it's something I always think about when I have done consultancy about working with athletes to develop their, their pre-performance routine and trying to build in this consistency. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge thing. I know I've seen videos on YouTube of Tiger Woods hitting a driver and hitting a, a different club five or six years apart, and they were timed to the to the millisecond, pretty much the same. It's as... crazy, isn't it? It's just so uh, yeah, and, it, and 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 I think if we can get those lower level, obviously not everyone's Tiger Woods, but lower level athletes who are, who are looking to get better and looking to improve, that's one way I think of really trying to hone in on their performance is getting this this pre-performance routine consistent and as I guess as consistent as possible. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So just thinking about your your research again, uh, I know you've done quite a lot of research in professional rugby in in terms of how how athletes can cope more effectively with stress. Do you want to tell the listeners a, a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I guess the last sort of 15 years have been you know very fortunate to conduct you know several studies with with professional rugby union players. So I think I'll start off with the stress aspect of it. And one thing that we found is that although professional rugby union players experience many, many different stresses, there's actually three that recur over time. So they're physical errors, so missing a tackle, uh, play, uh, making a poor pass, a mental uh, error, which is about uh, making a wrong decision, and then also injury. And these three stresses, so either either being injured and concerned about getting injured, so these three stresses account for 75% of all stresses. So if you're a rugby player out on the pitch training, you know, three quarters of the stresses you're going to have in that particular match will be about those things. And I think from a psychological perspective, from a coaching perspective, it's like, it's, I think it's really important, again, this awareness of that, the understanding of that to, to, to then help these players. And then in terms of coping then, so some of the key the key coping strategies that they engage in were uh, shutting out negative thoughts, uh, increasing their effort. So when when things are getting tough, maybe they're not, they've made some poor mistakes, uh, actually focusing in on their effort. And I, I, you know, I did also observe in one particular place, some, uh, I guess an error, uh, he made a mistake. This was a sort of a premiership reviewing player and his coping strategy was to make sure he was stood in a position where he couldn't receive the ball the next play. So it's kind of like behavioural avoidance. And that that kind of goes on as well. Not with all players, but with some, with some players. So the, the, there are a variety of different different coping strategies. But the key to for enhancing and managing stress and performing under pressure are what are known as these kind of like task-oriented stress, uh, coping strategies. So uh, things like logically analysing the situation. If I've made a mistake, why did that mistake occur? What did I do wrong? What can I do next time to prevent that occurring? Uh, engaging in uh, visualisation, so that probably be pre-match. Uh, blocking out, I see I mentioned blocking out negative thoughts. So these are these key, these key uh, coping strategies which are used by these players. Take me back to the to the effort side of things and then the task orientated part. So are you are you basically trying to hand over so they're they're focusing on internal factors within their control in in the way that they sort of review situations like that? Yeah. So they're so they're looking to identify a problem and they're looking to master a situation. So they're looking to do yeah internally do what they can to uh, prevent that if it's a mistake, mental error, physical error. They're preventing that from occurring. So bear in mind that these they spend the most of the time contending with these three key stressors. I'll tell you one thing that is interesting is that so I did this study with a diary study with these professional rebuilding players. They play, they were they're in a high, they're a, a top professional team playing in the Heineken Cup. And then we replicated that study with the England under 18 players. Now, 
in comparison to these are age group players, they were much more bothered about coach criticism. So for the professional players, the, the adults, that very, that featured quite uh, rarely as a stressor. Well, I know they'll have been criticised because, you know, I was involved in the environment and I know they weren't criticised, but they just weren't bothered. Whereas for these younger players, that was a much more prevalent stressor. And I think that's a kind of a, a nice take-home message if you if you you know work with different age group athletes or particularly younger athletes. As a coach, they're more impacted by their your their interactions with you, and it has more of a I guess more of a it can have more of a negative impact than the the older players. So you've got that old task ego orientation side of things to to factor in as a coach. So. Yeah, yeah you, the way you communicate, your words, the tone of your voice, your body language is going to be very, very powerful in in that setting. But to, yeah, with the developmental athletes. And, and if you look at the context as well, you know, they're, you know, age group players, so they're looking to progress. These are England under 18 players, so they're looking to progress to the, the 20s, probably looking to progress within their club, you know, club career as well. So they know that, you know, they've got a showcase to play for, play for England under 18. So that factors that, you know, and they're all probably planning a, a nice long professional career ahead of them, which, you know, the, but the numbers show that not all of them will have that. and Not many of them did have long professional careers. So you can see why they're probably a bit more, I guess, is it, you know, vulnerable to, to comments from a coach. Because the common coaches have so much power at that. You know, if you look at the pros, you know, they've all got two, one or two year contracts. So they know that they're tied in for that specific amount of time. So that although they can get dropped, they've got a contract with the club. Their income secure for however however long remain on their contract. Where these England under eighteen players be dropped, and that's it. Never seen again at that level. Yeah, yeah. Like you say, the place and such a huge emphasis on on being able to make it and yeah, yeah impressing other people in, in that way. So again, yeah, being able to to shift their focus um, is a, is a is a huge thing there. So yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I was wondering if you can give three key takeaways there for the for the listeners based on our conversation. Yeah, so so mental toughness is a is a psychological attribute that there is a genetic component, but it can be developed. So that's kind of the first thing. Secondly, we know it can be developed by exposing athletes to pressure, and but not just exposing pressure to pressure. You've actually got to teach them strategies. Uh, to manage uh, to manage the pressure, so strategies that, that that they can perform under, strategies that they can use when they're under pressurized situations, and finally, and then, and I suppose another take home message would be that when we're as a coach, as a psychologist, when working with athletes of different ages, is not to treat them all the same. Just because a high level professional player may experience certain types of stresses, it doesn't mean to say that. You know, a player even in the same position, a, a different age group will experience those same stresses. So it's about knowing the athlete, and but also knowing about some of the age demographics and some of the factors that may may influence how they're feeling. And by by engaging in those factors, I think as, as coaches, psychologists, we can really enhance the well being of athletes. I think that's three now, is it? <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah, and uh, they're, they're three really really helpful suggestions there for, for the listeners i'm guessing these suggestions are are in this new book that you you've got out as well yeah tell, so uh, I, tell people more about that and where they can yeah. find you yeah thanks david yeah so i just published third edition of my uh of a book uh, it's called psychology and sports coaching theory and practice it's published by routledge and it's a book that it, it's one of my passions is about helping coaches to teach psychology uh, in a in a safe and effective way, you know I've worked with quite a few uh, coaches over the years, and that's one thing that they think is lacking. So they'll spend a lot of time, you know, working on technical, tactical skills, and sometimes they have either maybe lacking confidence to teach psychology or to incorporate psychology, or just uh, they don't really know enough about it. And when I say about psychology, I mean about sort of developing the environment, how to support an injured athlete. So it's kind of how as you as a coach can deliver effective feedback, uh, how you can understand athletes better. So it's, so the, the book, yeah, is lots of, I think, 20 or different chapters, uh, ranging from de- delivering mental skills to actually uh, things such as developing a coach-athlete relationship, 
building team cohesion, developing athlete leaders. So it's quite a broad, a broad range of topics in the in the third edition. So yeah, in terms of how you can contact me, you know, I'm always interested to hear from people, whether it be coaches, aspiring sports psychologists, or athletes. Uh, I'm based at Hull University. My email address is a.nichols at hull.ac.uk. Uh, I've also recently joined LinkedIn and I'm, you know, regularly posting uh, extracts from my papers, uh, extracts from the book, just trying to provide uh, people with, you know, some information that hopefully some of it may be of use. Excellent. Well, yeah, keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, I've obviously been spotting uh, some of your posts on LinkedIn and yeah, they're, they're really relevant and, and useful. Yeah, appreciate your, your time, Adam. All of those little notes there will go into the show notes. So if people do want to contact you, they've, they've got something concrete. Yeah, so, brilliant. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Where do I start? There were so many excellent bits of advice there offered by Adam. I sincerely hope that the conversation has given you some helpful reminders. One thing I'd like you to consider is that mental toughness is a personality trait. It's a plastic personality trait that can be developed. It's simple in that a mentally tough person will give themselves a better chance of dealing better with pressure. Though, as Adam discussed, and the way our conversation went, it is a lot more complex than that and needs more thought. In a rugby setting, parts of this personality will be more important than if you're a golfer or a clear pigeon shooter. For instance, interpersonal confidence, where you feel comfortable in groups, where you speak your mind, when you actually have something to say, where you're willing to take charge of a situation and play a significant role when you're working with other people, like your teammates. You won't be influenced by others if you know that you're right inside, again, if you've got high interpersonal confidence. And this to the golfer or the clear pigeon shooter won't be as important as it is in team sports. Though in general, levels of commitment, confidence and ability, emotional control, risk orientation, all will come into play in the vast majority of sports. So if you'd like to measure your own mental toughness as a coach or as a rugby player or for your team, please do get in touch. It is possible and can really help you put a development program in place or to ensure that you're more aware of the traps that you're likely to fall into. If you'd like to have a chat about measuring your mental toughness, please do feel free to drop me a message via social media or via email. My email address is info at sport-excellence.co.uk. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.